had it. And now I don't. Look a little better. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not quite ready to stream yet. I'm still having lunch. Yes, I know it's 5.30. It's my lunch. Because I got up so late in the day. So I had breakfast at like noon. Five hours later, lunchtime, even though it's five o'clock. I was running super late today because things. Um, yeah, just things. Um, I like to take it easy on Saturdays when I can. Um, because, because I don't get to, you know. Um, you guys can still see me, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. <clears throat> um... Um, I, uh, so, I don't know. I just do what I need to do at my own pace. That's a good way to put it. So I was grocery shopping today. And what normally happens when I go to, to Walmart is um, I usually, the only time I go to Walmart is after work. I'm in my work uniform. And so then people think I work there. And they stop me and be like, where is this? Where can I find this? And I'm just like, and usually I help them. I don't, I'm not one of those people that's just like, I don't work here. <laughs> I don't say that. I never say that. I just say, oh yeah, because usually I do know where it is. Because <laughs> I go there so much and I buy everything there. Um, I, uh. I go and I, um, I help them. I show them. I show them. I usually take them where it is because that's what you do when you work in retail. You're trained to do that. And so I go and I help them. Um, and it's great because I love helping people. But today I had two ladies ask for my help and I wasn't even in uniform. <laughs> I'm just like, do they just think I work here? Like, <laughs> I don't know. But I helped them. And it was great because I love helping people and I love being used by God to help people that's how I see it God send them to me I am happy to help <clears throat> and I also let somebody go ahead of me in line that was good I know I almost never do that just because I never pay attention I never think to look behind me there was a guy behind me that had less items than I did. And I was like, hey, you go ahead. That was great. Never done that before. Feels pretty good. Okay. So I ha I was trying to look. I looked in three different places to find a weekly planner. Um, and because if you can see on my fridge, I have a piece of paper up there. And it, what it is, it's my weekly planner. Everything that I'm doing every day. Um, and it's great, but I have two sheets left because, um, my dear friend bought those for me on my birthday last year and there's a sheet for every week of the year. So that's my second to last sheet. So I need a new one. I looked all over the place and I can't find one. I can't find a weekly planner that's as good as that one. I know it's not going to be exactly like that one. That one's a Harry Potter one, in fact. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's another Harry Potter one. I want... I don't even know. Uh, I don't know. 
um, maybe I can show it on screen here. See if you can help me look. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nope. <sighs> this one? That's that's pretty good. Okay. So weekly planner. The problem is I don't want it in book form. I want it like where you can tear it out and stick it on the fridge. That's what I want. And I don't know how to search for that. I also need to find one that's cheap enough because I don't have a whole lot of money. Um, I don't want a book. I want, I don't know what it is. I don't know how to search for it. I don't know what the search term would be. Weekly planner. Um, I don't know. Maybe I can find another Harry Potter one. Oh, that's cute. This isn't. Oh, wait, that's the one. That's the one I have right there. <laughs> I don't want a new one though. I mean, I mean, that would be convenient, but it would be nice to have something different, you know? Oh, that's nice. Can I, oh, that's interesting. See, like I found some at like Target, but they're boring. They're lame. Ew, you know, habit tracker oh that's fancy that's cute it has a yeah like, oh visit mother huh that's fun oh this is a nice one I quite like it. That's a good one. These are cute though. Like the books one are the book ones are cute too. Oh, that's nice. That's more of a to-do list though. That's not Oh, look. Oh, look at the Felix Felicis little <laughs> weather tracker. What? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, that's cute. <gasps> Look at the Honey Dukes one. <gasps> that's so fun. Look at that. Oh, I love it. Oh. Amazon, you know just what I like. <sighs> oh, this one. They have so many of them. That one's cute too. Which one do I want? That one's cute. I like this one. This one's nice. Oh, but it only has, mm, I don't like it where they just do weekend. Like no, Saturdays and Sundays are just, are distinctly different for me. They need their own separate box, even if it's a smaller box. Time is of the essence. This one's trying to be Harry Potter, you know? You have to look out for those, too. There's fakes out there. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Oh, Ooh, this is cool. Look at this. The calendar box. I don't need that. But that's cute.
Aww. See, this one's made by the same people who did the one I have. You can tell because of the style of the font. Can I see it up close, please? I want to see how cute Harry is. Because if he's not cute, I don't want it. <laughs> um, that's cute, though. That one is exactly like the one I have right now. You know, Harry's kind of covering up the notes section. That's not very, that's not very helpful, Harry. What's wrong with you? The Honey Dukes one. I really like that one. See, so what's this supposed to be? Yeah, that's not Harry Potter. What's wrong with you? Not one we looked at. Generally, generally, my rule of thumb when looking through Amazon <laughs> is to look at the first three pages because usually after the first three pages, they're, they're off topic. They're not going to give you what you're looking for. Okay, so there's this one. It's Dobby, but it's the most generic thing I've ever seen. Just take Dobby off of it and it could be anything. The Honey Dukes one. Man, that one is cute. Super cute. Oh, that's cute. Oh, a Thomas Kincaid Mulan. Oh, I love that. That's not what I need, though. Yeah, now we're getting to books. Oh, these are cute. You can get the whole set. That's nice. I don't need it, though. I just need the... Boo. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're going into the books now. I'll try one more page. Until the very end. They're all like, Harry Potter, but that's not, that's not in Harry Potter at all. That's super generic. I hate it when they put generic quotes on it and be like, it's Harry Potter. No, it's not. Anybody could have said that. President Lincoln could have said that. <laughs> That's not Harry Potter. There's a lot of imposters out there. Just pay attention. All right, and now we're just getting to generic planners. Effing birds. Am I right? <laughs> All right, so, narrowing it down. This is super cute, I have to say. Not what we need, though. We've been over this. Okay, so, we have this one. The Honeydukes one, this one. So, that's three of them. We have this one, but I don't think I'm going to go with that one because it just has the weekend at the end and I don't like that. So we have three of them that we like. Four. It's just like the one I have now. Oh, it has a phoenix on it. <laughs> I want it. How many are there? How many? It's like nine dollars, so it makes me think like why is it so cheap? What am I not seeing about that? Okay, so I think there's four of them that I liked. And I think I already saw all four of them. That Honey Dukes one. I really like that one. I like, I like, I like. Mm, yeah, and there was nothing on page three. Okay, so which one's the cheapest? This one, it feels a little generic to me. I don't like that one as much as the other ones. This one's really cute. I like the flying car. I think it says something. Oh, what does the quote say? I need to know what it says. Okay, okay, okay. Ron says it in the movie. It does not do to dwell on dreams. Forget to live. Oh my gosh, that's my quote. It's a sign. <laughs> oh, wait. I forgot. But this one, there's no dates on them. Dang it. 
All right, not this one. Not this one. Okay, so then we've narrowed it down to two of them. So this one, which is 939, which seems really cheap to me. And then the other one, the Honeydukes one. Is that one? Have I seen that one yet yeah, on this page? Or is that on the next page? Oh, this one. 1095, which isn't that bad. Let me see. That is so cute. Look at that. That is awesome. It has a habit tracker. That's really cool. How many year? 2021. Well, there's no year on it. So, I mean, like, who cares? You know, it doesn't need to have. There's The year isn't on it. So, it's it's whatever. I'm sure there's the same amount of weeks in 2021 as there is in 2023. I need to eat my soup. 52 pages. Are there 52 weeks in a year? I thought there was 56. Which, all in all, It doesn't matter. I'll just get a new one when I run out. It doesn't matter if there's 56, really. Very promising. I want to take a closer look at this one. Let me look at it. I want to see it. Yes. Okay. Okay. I don't know why there has to be a snake on it. <laughs> How does Harry look? He looks a little strange, doesn't he? Hmm. I don't know. Is that gonna bother me? There's a mandrake on it? Oh, that's cute. Hmm. Hmm. I wish there was an easier way to look at it. I feel like it's, I don't know. I don't know. All year long, huh? Which one? Which one? I don't know. Hmm. I think I might go with the Honey Dukes one. Because the Honey Dukes one. Hmm. I don't know. Because the Honey Dukes one. I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> the to-do list is too long. I feel like... Maybe we should go with the other one. Because the other one is just like the one I have now. Exactly like it. It's just the design's a little different. The notes are a little bit covered up. And the to-do's in the wrong place. But I can just swap them. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I can't decide. This is the one I have. That's the one I have, which is really nice. I like how the note section is nice and long and the to-dos are a little shorter, a little smaller. I don't know. What about the Honeydukes one again? <laughs>
Uh, I can't decide. I don't know. Maybe we'll, uh, I'll figure it out another time. I'll take time to stew on it. Mull it over. I'll keep it in mind. Okay. Alrighty. I just realized I forgot to um forgot to refill my water thing. My water filter. Okay. All right. We can start now. Hello, fellow witches and wizards. My name is Phoenix Jenny, and welcome to the stream. Welcome back to Storytime Saturday, where we'll be reading Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Yes, I know. It's been a million years since I last did this. It's okay. Harry Potter never gets old. <laughs> okay. So, um, my neighbors are being loud. I apologize. Um, I'm cold. I'm gonna turn on the heat. <clears throat> okay. So. Um, hi. Welcome to the stream. Um, this isn't just me just reading to you i also discuss things as they come up we make commentary feel free to join the commentary in the live chat or in the comment section down below if you're watching this and it's no longer live um feel free to like the stream as well it's really really helpful um and other things uh become a subscriber if you're not a subscriber and turn on notifications uh, so you can be notified the next time I upload and the next time I go live. Um, so it's looking like I'll be going live next week. Next week is going to be something. It's going to be long. Um, so I think I'm going to be streaming on Friday like normal. I'm going to be streaming Halo 3. But then on Saturday, Saturday is going to be my birthday stream. And I'm not entirely sure what I want to do for my birthday stream just yet. Um, I don't know. I'm thinking I'm going to play something. <laughs> um, so, uh, instead of doing Storytime Saturday, I'm going to be playing something. Uh, it's kind of a three-way between doing the next Sherlock Holmes game or playing some Nancy Drew or playing a Hopa game. I don't know. I haven't decided. If you have any ideas what you would like to see, let me know. Um, also, getting pretty excited for Hogwarts Legacy coming out on the 10th. Um, I would very much like to play it. Um, but I can't afford it right now, so it might be a little while before I can actually purchase it. And my computer is being a little weird right now, so I don't even know if it'll be able to run it. And by the looks of things, it's going to need some serious, serious, it's going to need a beastly computer to run it. So we'll see. Um, I do intend to play it, though, when we get there. I want to do a special 
I want to do, I want to make Saturdays more special. Um, make Harry Potter Saturdays where we read Harry Potter and we play Harry Potter. Oh, that'd be fun. Oh, maybe I should play Harry Potter for my birthday. I don't have many of the games, but I could probably, I do have, I do have three of the games I have on PC that I could play. Um, I don't know, maybe. Um, but I was thinking making a special Harry Potter, Harry Potter Saturdays where I could play Hogwarts Legacy and I could read Harry Potter and maybe even write some Harry Potter fan fiction on stream, show you how I do it and maybe even take ideas from the chat if there are any. Um, but that's tentative in the future, maybe possibly, I don't know, kind of thing. Um, so there's that, that might be coming. Um, if you want to know what is coming up, what I'm planning on doing, you can follow me on Twitter. I post things that I'm thinking of on Twitter, uh, link in the description. Also in the description is my Patreon. If you'd like to support me as a content creator, you can there. Um, I also am a writer. So I write things. Um, I have essays and poetry and short stories and a bunch of other things. And if you want to read all of it, you have to become a patron. But if you can't become a patron, I have free stuff on there as well. It's just a place for me to post my writing so that people can read it. Um, I have a lot of Harry Potter stuff on there as well. I have a Harry Potter essay. I have a 60-page Harry Potter essay on the Harry Potter films, analyzing the films and how they compare to the books. That's on there. Um, you have to become a patron to read that, but that's on there. Um, I also have uh, Harry Potter fan fiction, which is free for everybody. You don't have to be a patron to read my Harry Potter fan fiction. Um, if you want to know what that's about, I will tell you. Um, um, it's a classic uh, narrative trope that a lot of people do um, for Harry Potter fan fiction. I'm not the first person to do this. Um, but there's a concept of swapping bodies, which, a lot, like I said, a lot of people do. A lot of people take two characters and they kind of switch places, see what it's like to be them, and then they learn things about themselves and whatever. I'm doing the same thing. Um, and... What I'm doing is not original at all. <laughs> um, I have uh, Harry and Draco swapping places. Um, they're going to live as each other for a little while and learn things about themselves and each other, learn to have compassion for each other, and may even become friends. Crazy, huh? And other stuff. There's other stuff in there, too. Um, there's um, minor plots going on at the same time. Um but it's really exciting, and uh, the prologue is on there, as well as chapters one and two, and it'd be really great to write chapter three on stream, if, or chapter four, whatever chapter I'm going to be on by the time I get to it. Um, uh, that'd be really cool to do, show you how I do it, and uh, take ideas, and just have a really good time uh, doing Harry Potter things. Harry Potter things are always the best. Um... Yeah, so check that out. Check out my Patreon, link in the description. Also in the description is my Instagram and my TikTok. You can follow me there. And uh, yeah, check out the stuff I post there as well. Okay, I know, I know. It's taken me forever to get there. Hopefully tonight's chapters aren't long. Um... And also, if you haven't seen my stream in a while, um, my camera has been funky, and so now I have a new setup. I'm actually using my webcam, my phone cam, <laughs> my webcam on my phone. No, I'm using the camera on my phone for my face cam. Um, and I have a ring light and a stand, and it's all fancy and professional looking. So really, really fun. Um, so in case you're wondering why things look a little different. Okay, so, see how long this chapter is. Pretty long. Okay, cool. What about the next one? I'm trying not to look at it too much because I don't want it spoiled for me. Nah, this one's long too. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> okay, 
Well, then let's let's get into it. Um, I'm going to do a recap of the last two chapters very, very briefly. The last two chapters were the Hungarian Horntail and the First Task. It's pretty much covered right there. Um, Harry and Ron are fighting, and that's a big deal. Harry's nervous about the First Task because dragons are scary. Um... And then Harry had to learn the Accio spell in order to summon his broomstick in order to defeat the dragon. Um, so he uses that, and he does the best out of the other tramp champions, I'm pretty sure, for that task. I don't actually remember. It's been a really long time. <laughs> he did a great job. He had nothing to worry about. Um, yeah. And then Ron came to his senses, and Ron is now a friend again, which is great. Okay. And so now, Chapter 21, The House Elf Liberation Front. Hooray, hooray. We're going to explore the kitchens in this one. All right. Chapter 21, The House Elf Liberation Front. Harry, Ron, and Hermione went up to the Owlery that evening to find Pigwidgeon so that Harry could send Sirius a letter telling him that he had managed to get past his dragon unscathed. On the way, Harry filled Ron in on everything Sirius had told him about Karkaroff. Karkaroff is the Death Eater. I forget what else he said about him, but that's the most important bit. Though shocked at first to hear that Karkaroff had been a Death Eater, by the time they entered the Owlery, the Owlery, Ron was saying that they ought to have suspected it all along. This, wasn't it? He said. Remember what Malfoy said on the train about his dad being friends with Karkaroff. Now we know where they know each other, where they knew each other. They were probably running around in masks together at the World Cup. I'll tell you one thing, though, Harry. If it was Karkaroff who put your name in the goblet, he's going to be feeling really stupid now, isn't he? Didn't work, did it? We only got a scratch. Come here. I'll do it. Pigwidgeon was so overexcited at the idea of a delivery he was flying around and around Harry's head, hooting incessantly. Ron snatched Pigwidgeon out of the air and held him still while Harry attached the letter to his leg. There's no way any of the other tasks are going to be that dangerous. How could they be? Ron went on as he carried Pigwidge into the window. You know what? I reckon you could win this tournament, Harry. I'm serious. Yeah, you could. It's going to be great. <laughs> Harry knew that Ron was only saying this to make up for his behavior for the last few weeks. But he appreciated it all the same. Hermione, however, leaned against the Allery wall, folded her arms, and frowned at Ron. Harry's got a long way to go before he finishes this tournament, she said seriously. If that was the first task, I hate to think what's coming next. Right, little ray of sunshine, aren't you? said Ron. You and Professor Trelawney should get together sometime. <laughs> he threw Pigwidgeon out of the window. Pigwidgeon plummeted twelve feet before managing to pull himself back up again. The letter attached to his leg was much larger and heavier than usual. Harry hadn't been able to resist giving Sirius a blow-by-blow -blow account of exactly how he had swerved, circled, and dodged the horntail. They watched Pigwidgeon disappear into the darkness, and then Ron said, Well, we'd better get downstairs for your surprise party, Harry. Fred and George should have nicked enough food from the kitchens by now. Sure enough, when they entered the Gryffindor common room, it exploded with cheers and yells again. There were mountains of cakes and flagons of pumpkin juice and butterbeer on every surface. Lee Jordan had let off some filibusters fireworks so that the air was thick with stars and sparks. And Dean Thomas, who was very good at drawing, had put up some impressive new banners, most of which depicted Harry zooming around the horntail's head on his firebolt, though a couple showed Cedric with his head on fire. 
I that's shouldn't be doing this in uh in light of what's going to happen. Harry helped himself to food. He had almost forgotten what it was like to feel properly hungry, and sat down with Ron and Hermione. He couldn't believe how happy he felt. Oh, cherish this, Harry. It is so short-lived. Cherish it. He had Ron back on his side. He had Ron back on his side. He'd gotten through the first task, and he wouldn't have to face the second one for three months. Blimey, this is heavy," said Lee Jordan, picking up the golden egg which Harry had left on a table and weighing it in his hands. "Open it, Harry. Go on. Let's just see what's inside it." I don't recommend it. <laughs> He's supposed to work out the clue on his own, Hermione said swiftly. It's in the tournament's rules. I was supposed to work out how to get past the dragon on my own, too, Harry muttered, so only Hermione could hear him, and she grinned rather guiltily. Yeah, go on, Harry, open it, several people echoed. Lee passed Harry the egg, and Harry dug his fingernails into the groove that ran all the way around it and prized it open. It was hollow and completely empty. But the moment Harry opened it, the most horrible noise, a loud screeching wailing, screechy wailing, filled the room. The nearest thing to it Harry had ever heard was the ghost orchestra nearly headless Nick's death day party, who had all been playing the musical saw. That's from Chamber of Secrets. Shut it! Fred bellowed, his hands over his ears. What was that? said Seamus Finnegan, staring at the egg as Harry slammed it shut again. Sounded like a banshee. Maybe you've got to get past one of those next, Harry. Maybe. It was someone being tortured, said Neville, who had gone very white and spilled sausage rolls all over the floor. You're going to have to fight the Cruciatus Curse. Don't be a prat, Neville. That's illegal, said George. They wouldn't use the Cruciatus Curse on the champions. I thought it sounded a bit like Percy singing. Maybe you've got to attack him while he's in the shower, Harry. (laughs) (laughs) Want a jam tart, Hermione, said Fred. Hermione looked doubtfully at the plate he was offering her. Fred grinned. Yeah, yeah. Always question what Fred George give you to eat. It's all right, he said. I haven't done anything to them. It's the custard creams you've got to watch. Neville, who had just bitten into a custard cream, choked and spat it out. Fred laughed. Just my little joke, Neville. Hermione took a jam tart. Then she said, Did you get all this from the kitchens, Fred? Yep, said Fred, grinning at her. He put put on a high-pitched squeak and imitated a house elf. Anything we can get you, sir? Anything at all? They're dead helpful. Give me a roast ox if I said I was peckish. How do you get in there? Hermione said in an innocently casual sort of voice. Easy, said Fred. Concealed door behind a painting of a bowl of fruit. Just tickle the pen, it giggles, and... He stopped and looked suspiciously at her. Why? Nothing, said Hermione quickly. I think it's cool that um, if you play Lego Harry Potter... By the way, I have played Lego Harry Potter on my channel, both of them, all four, all, all eight years, all eight parts, <laughs> all seven years, all seven years, let's put that, put it that way, all seven years on my channel, if you'd like to check it out. Um, what I think is cool is that they didn't just take from the movies, they took from the books too. And it's not part of the normal story mode, but if you are exploring the whole castle and you go, you can go to each of the dormitories, each of the common rooms for every house, including Hufflepuff. And according to the books, um, as we kind of saw earlier, Cedric was headed in that direction. He was heading in the way of the kitchens because he was going to his dormitory. The uh, Hufflepuff common room is right by the kitchens. In order to get to the Hufflepuff common room, I think you actually have to encounter a portrait of fruit and like you have to manipulate the blocks to make like a a pear or a fruit bowl or something in order to get to the Hufflepuff common room. And I think that's really cool that they took that idea from the book. Um, Going to try and lead the house elves out on strike now, are you? Said George. Going to give up all the leaflet stuff and try and stir them up into rebellion? Several people chortled. Hermione didn't answer. 
Don't go upsetting them and telling them they've got to take clothes and salaries, said Fred warningly. You'll put them off their cooking. Just then, Neville caused a slight diversion by turning into a large canary. Oh, sorry, Neville, Fred shouted over all the laughter. I forgot. It was the custard creams we hexed. Within a minute, however, Neville had molted, and once his feathers had fallen off, he reappeared looking entirely normal. He even joined in laughing. Canary creams, Fred shouted to the excitable crowd. George and I invented them. Seven sickles each. A bargain. It was nearly one in the morning when Harry finally went up to the dormitory with Ron, Neville, Seamus, and Dean. Before he pulled the curtains of his four-poster shut, Harry set his tiny model of the Hungarian horntail on the table next to his bed, where it yawned, curled up, and closed its eyes. Really? Harry thought as he pulled the hangings on his four-poster closed. Hagrid had a point. They were all right, really. Dragons. Yeah, yeah. Now that you're not facing one anymore. <laughs> yeah, suddenly you're brave. I wrote that here. Um, I think it's cool that in Half-Blood Prince, the movie, you actually see the tiny model of the, um, of the dragon that's also in Goblet of Fire, the film. You can see it featured in, um, at Weezes Wizard Weezes, which is, uh, a nod to the fact that they were able to afford to build their own shop because Harry gave his winnings to them, as we'll see when we finish the book. The start of December brought wind and sleet to Hogwarts. Drafty, though the castle always was in winter, Harry was glad of its fires and thick walls every time he passed the Durmstrang ship on the lake, which was pitching in the high winds, its black sails billowing against the dark skies. He thought the Bobatin's caravan was likely to be pretty chilly, too. Hagrid, he noticed, was keeping Madame Maxime's horses well provided with their preferred drink of single malt whiskey. The, fum the fumes wafting from the trough in the corner of their paddock was enough to make the entire care of magical creatures class lightheaded. This was helpful, as they were still tending the horrible scroots and needed their wits about them. I'm not sure whether they hibernate or not. Hagrid told the shivering class in the windy pumpkin patch next lesson. Thought we'd just try and see if they fancied a kip. We'll just settle them down in these boxes. There were now only ten scroots left. Apparently their desire to kill one another had not been exercised out of them. Each of them was now approaching a six feet in length. Their thick gray armor, their powerful scuttling legs, their fire-blasting ends, their stings, and their suckers combined to make the scroots the most repulsive things Harry had ever seen. The class looked dispiritedly at the enormous boxes Hagrid had brought out, all lined with pillows and fluffy blankets. We'll just lead him in here, Hagrid said, and put the lids on, and we'll see what happens. But the scroots, it transpired, did not hibernate, and did not appreciate being forced into pillow-lined boxes and nailed in. Hagrid was soon yelling, Don't panic now, don't panic! while the scroots rampaged around the pumpkin patch, now strewn with the smoldering wreckage of the boxes. Most of the class, Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle in the lead, had fled into Hagrid's cabin through the back door and barricade, barricaded themselves in. Harry, Ron, and Hermione, however, were among those who remained outside trying to help Hagrid. Together they managed to restrain and tie up nine of the scroots, though at the cost of numerous burns and cuts. Finally, only one scroot was left. Don't frighten him now, Hagrid shouted as Ron and Harry used their wands to shoot jets of fiery sparks at the scroot, which was advancing menacingly on them, its sting arched, quivering over its back. Just try and slip the rope around its sting, so we wouldn't hurt any of the others. Yeah, we wouldn't want that, Ron shouted angrily as he and Harry backed into the wall of Hagrid's cabin, still holding the scroot off with their sparks. Well, 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 this does look fun. Rita Skeeter was leaning on Hagrid's garden fence, looking in at the mayhem. She was wearing a thick magenta cloak with a furry purple collar today, and her crocodile skin handbag was over her arm. Hagrid launched himself forward on top of the scroot that was cornering Harry and Ron, and flattened it. A blast of fire shot out of its end, withering the pumpkin plants nearby. Who are you? 
Hagrid asked Rita Skeeter as he slipped a loop of rope around the scroot's sting and tightened it. Rita Skeeter, Daily Prophet reporter, Rita replied, beaming at, her, at him. Her gold teeth glinted. Thought Dumbledore said you weren't allowed inside the school anymore, said Hagrid, frowning slightly as he got off the slightly squashed shroot and started tugging it over to its fellows. Rita acted as though she hadn't heard what Hagrid had said. What are these fascinating creatures called? She asked, beaming still more widely. Blast and scroots, grunted Hagrid. Really, said Rita, apparently full of lively interest. I've never heard of them before. Where did they come from? Harry noticed a dull red flush rising up out of Hagrid's wild black beard, and his heart sank. Where had Hagrid got the scroots from? Hermione, who seemed to be thinking along these lines, said quickly, They're very interesting, aren't they? Aren't they, Harry? What? Oh, yeah. Ouch. Interesting, said Harry as she stepped on his foot. Ah, you're here, Harry, said Rita Skeeter as she looked around. So you like care of magical creatures, do you? One of your favorite lessons? Yes, said Harry stoutly. Hagrid beamed at him. Lovely, said Rita. Really lovely. Been teaching long, she added to Hagrid. Harry noticed her eyes travel over Dean, who had a nasty cut across one cheek, Lavender, whose robes were badly singed, Seamus, who was nursing several burnt fingers, and then to the cabin windows where most of the class stood, their noses pressed against the glass, waiting to see if the coast was clear. This is only my second year, said Hagrid. Lovely. I don't suppose you'd like to give an interview, would you? Share some of your experience of magical creatures. The Prophet does a zoo zoological column every Wednesday, as I'm sure you know. We could feature these, uh, bang-ended scoots. Blast-ended scroots, Hagrid said eagerly. Uh, yeah, why not? I don't recommend it. Harry had a very bad feeling about this, but there was no way of communicating it to Hagrid without Rita Skeeter seeing, so he had to stand and watch in silence as Hagrid and Rita Skeeter made arrangements to meet in the Three Broomsticks for a good long interview later that week. Then the bell rang up at the castle, signaling the end of the lesson. "'Well, goodbye, Harry,' Rita Skeeter called merrily to him as he set off with Ron and Hermione. "'Until Friday night, then, Hagrid.' "'She'll twist everything,' he says," Harry said under his breath. Just as long as he didn't import those scroots illegally or anything, said Hermione desperately. They looked at one another. It was exactly the sort of thing Hagrid might do. Oh, it's okay. She's not interested in the blast-ended scroots at all. She won't ask about them at all. Hagrid's been in loads of trouble before, and Dumbledore's never sacked him, said Ron consolingly. Worst that can happen is Hagrid will have to get rid of the scroots. Sorry, did I say worst? I meant best. Harry and Hermione laughed, and feeling slightly more cheerful, went off to lunch. Harry thoroughly enjoyed double divination that afternoon. Which is not something he would typically say. I'm going to read that again. <laughs> Harry thoroughly enjoyed double divination that afternoon. They were still doing star charts and predictions, but now that he and Ron were friends once more, the whole thing seemed rather seemed very funny again. Professor Trelawney, who had been so pleased with the pair of them when they had been predicting their horrific their own horrific deaths, quickly became ir irritated as they sniggered through her explanation of the various ways in which Pluto could disrupt everyday life. I would think, she said in a mystical whisper that did not conceal her obvious annoyance, that some of us, she stared very meaningfully at Harry, might be a little less frivolous had they seen what I had seen during my crystal gazing last night. As I sat here, absorbed in my needlework, the urge to consult the orb overpowered me. I arose, I settled myself before it, and I gazed into its crystalline depths. And what do you think I saw gazing back at me? An ugly old bat of size specks? Ron muttered under his breath. Harry fought hard to keep his face straight. Death, my dears. Pravati and Lavender both put their hands over their mouths, looking horrified. Yes, said Professor Trelawney, nodding impressively. It comes ever closer. 
It circles overhead like a vulture, ever lower, ever lower over the castle. She stared pointedly at Harry, who yawned very widely and obviously. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> It'd be a bit more impressive if she hadn't done it about 80 times before. Harry said as they finally regained the fresh air of the staircase beneath Professor Trelawney's room. But if I drop dead every time she's told me I'm going to, I'd be a magical miracle. Sorry, medical miracle. You'd be a sort of extra concentrated ghost, said Ron, chortling as they passed the bloody baron going in the opposite direction, his wide eyes staring sinisterly. At least we didn't get homework. I hope Hermione got loads off Professor Vector. I love not working when she is. But Hermione wasn't at dinner, nor was she in the library when they went to look for her afterward. The only people in there was Victor Crumb. Ron hovered behind the, book sh the bookshelves for a while, watching Crumb, debating in whispers with Harry whether he should ask for an autograph. But then Ron realized that six or seven girls were lurking in the next row of books, debating exactly the same thing, and he lost his enthusiasm for the idea. Wonder where she's got to. Ron said as he and Harry went back to Gryffindor Tower. Dunno. Boulder Dash. But the fat lady had barely begun to swing forward when the sound of racing feet behind them announced Hermione's arrival. Harry, she panted, skidding to a halt beside him. The fat lady stared down at her, eyebrows raised. Harry, you've got to come. You've got to come. The most amazing thing's happened. Please. She seized Harry's arm and started to try to drag him back along the corridor. What's the matter? Harry said. I'll show you when we get there. Oh, come on, quick! Harry looked around at Ron. He looked back at Harry, intrigued. Okay, Harry said, starting off back down the corridor with Her Hermione, Ron, hurrying to keep up. Blech, I feel like I read that all wrong. Harry said, starting off back down the corridor with Hermione, Ron, hurrying to keep up. Oh, don't mind me. The fat lady called irritably after them. Don't apologize for bothering me. I'll just hang here, wide open till you get back, shall I? Yeah, thanks, Ron shouted over his shoulder. Hermione, where are we going? Harry asked as she had led them down through six floors and started down the marble staircase into the entrance hall. You'll see. You'll see in a minute, said Hermione excitedly. She turned left at the bottom of the staircase and hurried toward the door through which Cedric Diggory had gone the night after the Goblet of Fire had regurgitated his and Harry's names. Harry had never been through here before. He and Ron followed Hermione down a flight of stone steps, but instead of ending up in a gloomy underground passage like the one that led to Snape's dungeon, they found themselves in a broad stone corridor brightly lit with torches and decorated with cheerful paintings that were mainly of food. Oh, hang on, said Harry slowly, halfway down the corridor. Wait a minute, Hermione. What? She turned around to look at him, anticipation all over her face. I know what this is about, said Harry. He nudged Ron and pointed to the painting just behind Hermione. It showed a gigantic silver fruit bowl. Hermione, said Ron, cottoning on. You're not trying to rope us into the spew stuff again. No, no, I'm not, she said hastily. And it's not spew, Ron. Changed the name, have you? said Ron, frowning at her. What are we now, then? The House of Liberation Front? I'm not barging into that kitchen trying to make them stop work. I'm not doing it. I'm not asking you to, Hermione said impatiently. I came down here just just now to talk to them all, and I found... Oh, I remember! I'm like, why? She's all excited about the kitchen. Why is she... She's freaking out as if Harry should be excited, too, and I'm confused. I just remembered why she's excited. Oh, come on, Harry, I want to show you. She seized his arm again, pulled him in front of the picture of the giant fruit bowl, stretched out her forefinger, and tickled the huge green pear. It began to squirm, chuckling, and suddenly turned into a large green door handle. Hermione seized it, pulled the door open, and pushed Harry hard in the back, forcing him inside. He had one brief glimpse of an enormous high-ceilinged room, large as the great hall above it, with mounds of glittering brass pots and pans heaped around the stone walls and a great brick fireplace at the other end, when something small hurtled toward him from the middle of the room, squealing, Harry Potter, sir! Harry Potter! Yay! <laughs> Now 
Next second, all the wind had been knocked out of him as the squealing elf hit him hard in the midriff, hugging him so tightly he thought his ribs would break. D Dobby? Harry gasped. It is Dobby, sir, it is, squealed the voice from somewhere around his navel. Dobby has been hoping and hoping to see Harry Potter, sir, and Harry Potter's come to see him, sir. Yay. <laughs> Dobby let go and stepped back a few paces, beaming up at Harry, his enormous green tennis ball-shaped eyes brimming with tears of happiness. He looked almost exactly as Harry remembered him, the pencil-shaped nose, the bat-like ears, the long fingers and feet, all except the clothes, which were very different. When Dobby had worked for the Malfoys, he had always worn the same filthy old pillowcase. Now, however, he was wearing the strangest assortment of garments Harry had ever seen. He had done an even worse job of dressing himself than the Wizards at the World Cup. He was wearing a tea cozy for a hat, on which he had pinned a number of bright badges, a tie patterned with horseshoes over a bare chest, a pair of what looked like children's soccer shorts, and odd socks. One of these, Harry saw, was the black one Harry had removed from his own foot and tricked Mr. Malfoy into giving Dobby, thereby setting Dobby free. The other was covered in pink and orange stripes. I've seen those be answers to hard Harry Potter trivia questions, so I've marked it. Dobby, what are you doing here? Harry said in amazement. Dobby has come to work at Hogwarts, sir, Dobby squealed excitedly. Professor Dumbledore gave Dobby and Winky jobs, sir. Winky, said Harry. She's here too? Yes, sir, yes, said Dobby, and he seized Harry's hand and pulled him off into the kitchen between the four long wooden tables that stood there. Each of these tables, Harry noticed as he passed them, was positioned exactly beneath the four house tables above in the great hall. At the moment, they were clear of food, dinner having finished, but he supposed that an hour ago they'd been laden with dishes that were then sent up through the ceiling to their counterparts above. At least a hundred little elves were standing around the kitchen, beaming, bowing, and curtsying as Dobby let Harry pass them. They were all wearing the same uniform, a tea towel stamped with the Hogwarts crest and tied, as Winky's had been, like a toga. Dobby stopped in front of the brick fireplace and pointed. Winky, sir, he said. Winky was sitting on a stool by the fire. Unlike Dobby, she had obviously not for foraged for clothes. She was wearing a neat little skirt and blouse with a matching blue hat, which had holes in it for her large ears. However, while every one of Dobby's strange collection of garments was so clean and well cared for that it looked brand new, Winky was plainly not taking care of her clothes at all. There were soup stains all down her blouse and a burn in her skirt. Hello, Winky, said Harry. Winky's lip quivered. And then she burst into tears, which spilled out of her great brown eyes and splashed down her front, just as they had done at the Quidditch World Cup. Oh, dear, said Hermione. She and Ron had followed Harry and Dobby to the end of the kitchen. Winky, don't cry. Please don't. But Winky cried harder than ever. Dobby, on the other hand, beamed up at Harry. Would Harry Potter like a cup of tea? He squeaked loudly over, Do over Winky's sobs. Uh, yeah, okay, said Harry. Instantly, about six house elves came trotting up behind him, bearing a large silver tray laden with a teapot, cups for Harry, Ron, and Hermione, a milk jug, and a large plate of biscuits. Good service, Ron said in an impressed voice. Hermione frowned at him, but the elves all looked delighted. They bowed very low and retreated. How long have you been here, Dobby? Harry asked as Dobby handed around the tea. Only a week, Harry Potter, sir, said Dobby happily. Dobby came to see Professor Dumbledore, sir. You see, sir, it is very difficult for a house elf who has been dismissed to get a new position, sir. Very difficult indeed. At this, Winky howled even harder, her squashed tomato of a nose dribbling all down her front, though she made no effort to stem the flow. Dobby has traveled the country for two whole years, sir, trying to find work, Dobby squeaked. But Dobby hasn't found work, sir, because Dobby wants paying now. 
The house elves all around the kitchen who had been listening and watching with interest all looked away at these words as though Dobby had said something rude and embarrassing. Hermione, however, said, Good for you, Dobby. Thank you, miss, said Dobby, grinning toothily at her. But most wizards doesn't want a house elf who wants paying, miss. That's not the point of a house elf, they says. And they slammed the door in Dobby's face. Dobby likes work, but he wants to wear clothes, and he wants to be paid, Harry Potter. Dobby likes being free. <laughs> He's so cute. Happy free, bud. The Hogwarts house elves had now started edging away from Dobby as though he were carrying something contagious. Winky, however, remained where she was, though there was a definite increase in the volume of her crying. And then, Harry Potter, Dobby comes to visit Winky and finds out Winky has been free too, sir, said Dobby delightedly. At this, Winky flung herself forward off her stool and lay face down on the flagstone floor, beating her tiny fists upon it and positively screaming with misery. Hermione hastily dropped down to her knees beside her and tried to comfort her, but nothing she said made the slightest difference. Dobby continued with his story, shouting shrilly over Winky's screeches. And then Dobby had the idea, Harry Potter, sir. Why doesn't Dobby and Winky find work together? Dobby says. Where is there enough work for two house elves, says Winky. And Dobby thinks, and it comes to him, sir, Hogwarts. So Dobby and Winky came to see Professor Dumbledore, sir, and Professor Dumbledore took us on. Dobby beamed very brightly, and happy tears welled in his eyes again. And Professor Dumbledore says he will pay Dobby, sir, if Dobby wants paying. And so Dobby is a free elf, sir, and Dobby gets a galleon a week and one day off a month. <laughs> He's so sweet. And Dumbledore is so accommodating. It just well, makes me well up with joy. <laughs> That's not very much, Hermione shouted indignantly from the floor over Winky's continued screaming and fist beating. Professor Dumbledore offered Dobby ten galleons a week, and weekends off, said Dobby, suddenly giving a little shiver as though the prospect of so much leisure and riches were frightening. But Dobby beat him down, miss. Dobby likes freedom, miss, but he isn't wanting too much, miss. He likes work better. Ugh! It's so good. I don't know. I don't know a more pure, gentler soul than Dobby. And how much is Professor Dumbledore paying you, Winky? Hermione asked kindly. If she had thought this would cheer Winky, cheer up Winky, she was wisely mistaken. Winky did not stop crying, but when she sat up, she was glaring at Hermione through her massive brown eyes, her whole face sopping wet and suddenly furious. Winky is a disgraced elf, but Winky is not yet getting paid, she squeaked. Winky is not sunk so low as that. Winky is properly ashamed of being freed. Ashamed, said Hermione blankly, but Winky, come on. It's Mr. Crouch who should be ashamed, not you. You didn't do anything wrong. He was really horrible to you. Well, in her eyes, she did do something wrong, because she let Barty Crouch Jr. go. She let him out of her sight. Um, so, uh, so technically in her, in, in her eyes, she did do something wrong. But at these words, Winky clapped her hands over the holes in her hat, flattening her ears so that she couldn't hear a word, and screeched, You is not insulting my master, miss. You is not insulting Mr. Crouch. Mr. Crouch is a good wizard, miss. Mr. Crouch is right to sack bad Winky. Winky is having trouble adjusting, Harry Potter, squeaked Dobby confidentially. Winky forgets she is not bound to Mr. Crouch any more. She's allowed to speak her mind now, but she won't do it. Can't Hellsoft speak their minds about their masters then? Harry asked. Oh no, sir, no, said Dobby, looking suddenly serious. Tis part of the house of enslavement, sir. We keep the secret, their secrets in our silence, sir. We uphold the family's honor, and we never speak ill of them. Though Professor Dumbledore told Dobby, he does not insist upon this. Professor Dumbledore said, we is free to, to... Dobby looked suddenly nervous and beckoned Harry closer. Harry bent forward. Dobby whispered, he said, we is free to call him a, a balmy old codger if we like, sir. 
Dumbledore gave a frightened sort of giggle. Dumbledore is such a good man, I can't. Man, he's such a good dude. But Dobby is not wanting to, Harry Potter, he said, talking normally again and shaking his head so that his ears flapped. Dobby likes Professor Dumbledore very much, sir, and is proud to keep his secrets and our silence for him. But you can say what you like about the Malfoys now, Harry asked him, grinning. A slightly fearful look came into Dobby's immense eyes. Dobby, Dobby could, he said doubtfully. He squared his small shoulders. Dobby could tell Harry Potter that his old masters were, were bad dark wizards. Dobby stood for a moment, quivering all over, horror-struck by his own daring. Then he rushed over to the nearest table and began banging his head on it very hard, squealing, Bad Dobby! Bad Dobby! Harry seized Dobby by the back of his tie and pulled him away from the table. Thank you, Harry Potter, thank you, said Dobby breathlessly, rubbing his head. You just need a bit of practice, <laughs> Harry said. Oh. I love this. Um, what I, the whole issue of house elves is really complicated because as you can see, as you can see, like the house elves like to be enslaved, most of them. Um, and they seem happy and um, prefer it, right? And so you're just like, Hermione, what's wrong with you? They like it. Why are you hurting them? Why are you doing this? But then, later, in the last book, it becomes a little more clear when Harry starts to treat um, a creature with respect. Um, and that whole discussion with Hermione, because Harry at first is, is livid with Creature because he believes it's Creature's fault that Sirius Black is dead, which he's, it's partly true. Um, and so he mistreats Creature, he yells at him, um, tries to get him, tries to force him to obey him, because Creature belongs to Harry now since everything that was Sirius Black's belongs to Harry um, when Sirius dies. Um, but Hermione insists that creature treat him that that he treat creature with respect um and uh it's it's so it's just your heart just softens at it when um when uh harry sees how much creature is hurting because he feels like he failed his master master regulus black um when black told him to destroy the locket um and then he's just on the floor crying and Harry's like, I don't, I don't get it. He's like, I don't get how you could be so broken up that Regulus is dead, but turn his brother over to have him killed. And then Hermione stops Harry and she explains it to him. She says, Creature doesn't pay loyalty to people the same way you and I do. He's kind to those who are kind to him which now that i think about it is like normal people that that's pretty much that's that's pretty normal for people to give loyalty to people who are loyal to them but he's saying he didn't what she meant was he doesn't see between households don't typically see between good wizards and bad wizards they see wizards who are good to them and wizards who are not and he was loyal to the black family he was loyal to regulus and to his mother because they were kind to him to also to bellatrix lestrange and to narcissa and um people you know uh, who are death eaters who he encountered he was kind they were kind to him so he was kind to them and he gave them information about Sirius black and all of that right so um and so uh, but he's not kind to Sirius Black because Sirius Black mistreated him. Um, and so Harry, following in Sirius Black's footsteps, was mistreating him. And so Creature mistreated Harry back, right? And so then the moment Harry softens and he realizes how he was wrong and he treats Creature with kindness, he, um, you know, Creature begins to change. 
as a being and creature is no longer this wretched pitiful hateful creature it becomes kind and joyful and happy um and it's just how you treat people matter you know it causes them to become who they're supposed to be when you do that and so that even wasn't originally what i was going to talk about um though it's kind of related i dobby And so it just makes you question the whole house of slavery thing. It's like they like the slavery, but they're still slaves, right? So it makes you question what's the right thing to do? Is the right thing to set them free? Or is the right thing to keep them in slavery? Um, and... It kind of makes me think of people, I don't know how to talk about this. I don't know how to word this in a way that everybody can understand what I'm trying to say. Because um, I'm a Christian, and I talk about this relatively frequently. Um, so I see things with a Christian lens. That's the lens that I see things in. And so when I look at this, it reminds me of people who live loosely. Um, it reminds me, the way Christians would put it, is it reminds me of people who live in sin. People who choose to live against God's commandments, against the way God had designed human beings to live. When people um, choose to go their own way, it kind of makes me think of that. And I know it's a little strange, but the thing is, in Christianity, when you live according to sin, you're actually enslaved to it. Um, and you might not feel like, it might not feel like slavery to you because you enjoy it. You like being a slave to sin. And it's not just, like, I can say that for myself too. Um, I sometimes make poor choices because it feels good. Because sin feels good. It does. It really does. Um, so, it, you know, it, it feels good to do... Um, the morally wrong thing sometimes. And so that's kind of what it makes me think of. These house elves who are enslaved, they actually enjoy being enslaved. But that doesn't mean it's good for them. And you see in Dobby what it looks like when you reject your slavery, when you reject your sin. Um, how he's living backwards the other house elves look at him and think he's backwards think he's different how could how could he do this this is against what everybody else is doing well that's exactly what christians look like um sometimes we live things that we seem completely backwards to other people right um but also there's still that nature within us that causes us to remember our slavery you could see here dobby he says something bad about the Malfoys and he instantly wants to, he instantly reverts back to his slavery and wants to punish himself for saying it. Um, and so sometimes Christians will do that too. We will backslide. That's what we, that's what we call it in Christianese in our culture. We call it backsliding. Um, where we, where something happens, we're triggered by something in life and we revert back to our old ways because we're upset or, or we're not being careful and we're just letting, we're letting ourselves go, so to speak. Um, and then our old nature comes back and we suddenly do things that we don't do anymore. Um, but we come back at least at least the good ones, we come back. No matter, how, no matter how many times we backslide, we come back. And uh, as Harry says, you just need a bit of practice. Um, just uh, keep fighting the good fight and uh, trying to fight temptation and all that. Um, yeah, odd thing. Yeah, but that's what it made me think of. Um, and so it does, and so it's just something to think about. House elves, even though they enjoy slavery, and I don't agree how Hermione goes about it. I don't think forcing them to be free is the answer. I don't think confronting them with being free is the answer. I don't think that's it. 
I think you need to come. I think you need to be gentle. I think Dumbledore does it wonderfully. Dumbledore doesn't force them to be free. What he does is he treats them with kindness. And he pays them if they want to be paid. He gives them days off if they want days off. He treats them with kindness. That's how you do it. Not by forcing your will on them. That's, that's not going to work. And I agree that that's the same way with people who live in sin. I think that way. I think that way as well, that forcing them to go to church and read the Bible and live the way that you live isn't the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. You really need to approach them with gentleness, with kindness, with humility and a soft heart. And to treat them like human beings is the only way that they will even begin to think about changing. It's the only way that they will feel like they're in a better place to accept the freedom that we're offering. Um, and I And I just man i've never made this revelation about ourselves before this is really cool um but yeah i think that hermione's going about it the wrong way i think dumbledore's going about it the right way and actually i think i'm gonna write that down hermione treats house elves the wrong way Oh, I can't spell. House elf. It's a hyphenated word. House elf. And it's house elves. Hermione treats house elves the wrong way. I'll put a star. Hermione treats house elves the wrong way. Dumbledore. treats house elves the right way. Yes. Okay, so what to take away from this is to treat people with kindness. That'll equip them better to become who they're supposed to be and to accept freedom from their sin. Treat people with kindness. Okay. All right. Practice, squealed Winky furiously. You just ought to be ashamed of yourself, Dobby, talking that way about your masters. They isn't my masters anymore, Winky, said Dobby defiantly. Dobby doesn't care what they think anymore. Yes. It is also the way you need to think about your sin. Do not let it master you. You are no longer a master of your... Your old self is no longer your master. Your past is no longer your master. Oh, you was a bad elf, Dobby, moaned Winky, tears leaking down her face once more. Poor Mr. Crouch, what is he doing without Winky? He is needing me. He is needing my help. I is looking after the Crouches all my life, and my mother is doing it before me, and my grandmother is doing it before me. Oh, what is they saying if they knew Winky? Oh, that, I didn't say that right at all. And my mother is doing it before me, and my grandmother is doing it before her. Oh, what is they saying if they knew Winky was freed? Oh, the shame, the shame. She buried her face in her skirt again and bawled. Winky, said Hermione firmly, I'm quite sure Mr. Crouch is getting along perfectly well without you. We've seen him, you know. You are seeing my master? said Winky breathlessly, raising her tear-stained face out of her skirt once more and goggling at Hermione. You were seeing him here at Hogwarts? Yes, said Hermione. He and Mr. Bagman are judges at the Triwiz in the Triwiz tournament. Winky's response makes me think of it, too. How she... She's not accepting her freedom. Um... That's the thing about being a slave to your sin as well, is that what you do feels right. Not only does it feel good, it feels like the right thing sometimes when it's not. Um, and rejecting it is really hard too sometimes. And it's really hard for Winky to accept her freedom because she's in so much pain and she can't 
fight. Um, she can't fight her slavery. Um, so it is difficult. That's not to say that it's easy to do. It's not. Um, Mr. Bagman comes too, squeaked Winky, and to Harry's great surprise, and Ron's and Hermione's too, but the looks on their faces, she looked angry again. Mr. Bagman is a bad wizard, a very bad wizard. My master isn't liking him, oh no, not at all. Bagman, bad, said Harry. Oh, yes, Winky said, nodding her head fiercely. My master is telling Winky some things, but Winky's not saying. Winky, Winky keeps her master's secrets. She dissolved yet again in tears. They could hear her sobbing into her skirt. Poor master, poor master, no Winky to help him no more. They couldn't get another sensible word out of Winky. They left her to her crying and finished their tea, while Dobby chatted happily about his life as a free elf and his plans for his wages. Dobby's going to buy a sweater next, Harry Potter, he said, happily pointing at his bare chest. Tell you what, Dobby, said Ron, who seemed to have taken a great liking to the elf. I'll give you the one my mum knits me this Christmas. I always get one from her. You don't mind maroon, do you? Oh my gosh. And this makes me think of the movie... Oh, Deathly Hallows Part 1, where Dobby comes in with Creature um, at Grimmauld Place. And she and he says to Dobby, Master Weasley, so good to see you again. And it's like, you've never met him! <laughs> you met him in the book, but not the movies. Oh, it's like, if you're going to cut things, you can't just shove it in later, you know? Ugh annoying but anyway <laughs> Dobby was delighted we might have to shrink it a bit to fit you Ron told him but it'll go well with your tea cozy as they prepared to take their leave many of the surrounding elves pressed in upon them offering snacks to take back upstairs Hermione refused with a pained look at the way the elves kept bowing and curtsying but Harry and Ron loaded their pockets with cream cakes and pies thanks a lot Harry said to the elves, who had all clustered around the door to say good night. See you, Dobby. Harry Potter, can Dobby come and see you sometime, sir? Dobby asked tentatively. Of course you can, said Harry, and Dobby beamed. You know what, said Ron, once he, Hermione, and Harry had left the kitchens behind and were climbing the, step, the steps into the entrance hall again. All these years, I've been really impressed with Fred and George, nicking food from the kitchens. Well, it's not exactly difficult, is it? They can't wait to give it away. I think it's the best thing that... Bleh, bleh, bleh. I think this is the best thing that could have happened to those elves, you know? Said Hermione, leading the way back up the marble staircase. Dobby coming to work here, I mean. The other elves will see how happy he is, being free, and slowly it'll dawn on them that they want that too. Let's hope they don't look too closely at Winky, said Harry. Oh, she'll cheer up, said Hermione, but she sounded a bit doubtful. Once the shock's worn off, and she's got used to Hogwarts, she'll see how much better off she is without that crouch man. She seems to love him, said Ron thickly. He had just started on a cream cake. Doesn't that... doesn't think much of Bagman, though, does she? said Harry. wonder what Crouch says at home about him. Probably says he's not a very good head of department, said Hermione. And let's face it, he's got a point, hasn't he? I'd still rather work for him than old Cameron. Crouch, said Ron. At least Bagman's got a sense of humor. Don't let Percy hear you saying that, Hermione said, smiling slightly. Yeah, well, Percy wouldn't want to work for anyone with a sense of humor, would he? Said Ron, now starting on a chocolate eclair. Percy wouldn't recognize the joke if it danced naked in front of him wearing to Dobby's tea cozy. <laughs> and that is the end of chapter 21. All right. I'm going to take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back for Chapter 22, The Unexpected Task. And this one's a fun one, all right? This one, this one's fun, okay? You're going to love this. All right. Um, uh, so I hope you are enjoying the stream. Please feel free to talk in the chat. Um, and uh, like the stream if you are enjoying it. Become a subscriber if you're not subscribed already. Turn on notifications. 
um, so you can be notified the next time I go live. The next time I upload, I will be going live next week on Friday and Saturday. Not entirely sure what I'm doing on Saturday. If you want to know what my plans are, follow me on Twitter. Link in the description. Also in the description is my Patreon if you'd like to read my writing or if you'd like to support me as a content creator. Um, I have free stuff on there as well. I also have a TikTok and an Instagram in the description. And I'll be back in 15 minutes. It's my buddy. It's Dobby. <laughs> Isn't he so cute? Got him at Universal Studios. <laughs> He's so cute. And I only just thought of him till after I read the chapter to bring him for the stream. My little buddy. Okay, so. Chapter 22. Let's go this one's a good one it's not my favorite chapter it's my second favorite chapter third favorite chapter second favorite chapter top three hands down top three this one's a good one all right chapter 22 the unexpected task potter Weasley, will you pay attention? Professor McGonagall's irritated voice cracked like a whip through the transfiguration class on Thursday, and Harry and Ron both jumped and looked up. It was the end of the lesson. They had finished their work. The guinea fowl they had been changing into guinea pigs had been shut away in a large cage on Professor McGonagall's desk. Neville still had feathers. They had copied down their homework from the blackboard, described with examples the ways in which transfigurations, transfiguring spells must be adapted when performing cross-species switches. The bell was due to ring at any moment, and Harry and Ron, who had been having a sword fight with a couple of Fred and George's fake wands at the back of the class, looked up, Ron holding a tin parrot and Harry a rubber haddock. Haddock. That's a fish, right? Haddock. Fish. Yeah. It's a fish. Here. Let's see if I can find a, a picture. Picture time. Picture time. Uh, this is a haddock. Cool. So that's what Harry was holding. A rubber one. <laughs> I forgot, I'm just gonna fix this. I feel like it's a little high. Ugh. And not centered. It's difficult to do this. Oh, I can move over now. Okay. It's hard to do it with my monitors and my setup. But, yay! <laughs> it's a little better. Okay. Now that Potter and Weasley have been kind enough to act their age, said Professor McGonagall with an anger, angry look at the pair of them as the head of Harry's haddock drooped and fell silently to the floor. Ron's parrot's beak had severed, in moments before, had severed it moments before. I have something to say to you all. This is very exciting. The Yule Ball is approaching, a traditional part of the Triwizard Tournament and an opportunity for us to socialize with our foreign guests. Now, the ball will be open only to fourth years and above, although you may invite a younger student if you wish. Lavender Brown let out a shrill giggle. Parvati Patil nudged her hard in the ribs, her face working furiously as she, too, fought not to giggle. They both looked around at Harry. Which is weird. Why would they look at Harry? Professor McGonagall ignored them, which Harry thought was distinctly unfair as she had just told off him and Ron. Okay, so... I forget. I know Harry goes with... Parvati. Or Parvati. I still don't know how to pronounce her name. 
Ron goes with Padma. Yeah, then that's right. That's that's how it happened. I know how, that's how it happened in the movie. I couldn't remember. That's exactly how it happened in the book. Maybe Parvati has a crush on him. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, like, we don't ever really hear from her. She's not... She's barely a secondary character. I don't know. I don't know if I read that last part. I will read it again. Professor McGonagall ignored them, which Harry thought was distinctly unfair, as she had just told him. Just told off him and Ron. Dress robes will be worn, Professor McGonagall continued, and the ball will start at eight o'clock on Christmas Day, finishing at midnight in the Great Hall. Now then, Professor McGonagall stared deliberately around the class. The Yule Ball is, of course, a chance for us all to, uh, let our hair down she said in a disapproving voice. Lavender giggled harder than ever, with her hand pressed hard against her mouth to stifle the sound. Harry could see what was funny this time. Professor McGonagall, with her hair in a tight bun, looked as though she had never let her hair down in any sense. But that does not mean, Professor McGonagall went on, that we will be relaxing the standards of behavior we expect from Hogwarts students. I will be most seriously displeased if a Gryffindor student embarrasses the school in any way. The bell rang, and there was the usual scuffle of activity as everyone packed their bags and swung them onto their shoulders. Professor McGonagall called above the noise. Potter, a word if you please. I'm so excited. Assuming this had something to do with his headless rubber haddock, Harry proceeded gloomily to the teacher's desk. Professor McGonagall waited until the rest of the class had gone, and then said, Potter, the champions and their partners. What partners? said Harry. Professor McGonagall looked suspiciously at him, as though she thought he was trying to be funny. Your partners for the Yule Ball, Potter, she said coldly. Your dance partners. Harry's insides seemed to curl up and shrivel. Dance partners? Harry, he felt himself going red. I don't dance, he said coinkly. Oh, yes, you do! <laughs> oh, yes, you do, said Professor McGonagall irritably. That's what I'm telling you. Traditionally, the champions and their partners open the bowl. Harry had a sudden mental image of himself in a top hat and tails, accompanied by a girl in a sort of frilly dress Aunt Petunia always wore to Uncle Vernon's work parties. I'm not dancing, he said. It is traditional said Professor McGonagall firmly. You are a Hogwarts champion, and you will do what is expected of you as a representative of the school. So make sure you get yourself a partner, Potter. But I don't... You heard me, Potter, said Professor McGonagall in a very final sort of way. <laughs> Let the fun begin. A week ago, Harry would have said finding a partner for a dance would be a cinch compared to taking on a Hungarian horntail. But now that he had done the latter and was facing the prospect of asking a girl to the ball, he thought he'd rather have another round with the dragon. <laughs> I think I'd take the dragon right now. <laughs> Harry had never known so many people to put their names down to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas. He always did, of course, because the alternative was usually going back to Privet Drive. But he had always been very much in the minority before now. This year, however, everyone in the fourth year and above seemed to be staying, and they all seemed to Harry to be obsessed with the coming ball, or at least all the girls were, and it was amazing how many girls Hogwarts suddenly seemed to hold. He had never quite noticed them before. There's girls everywhere! <laughs> Girls giggling and whispering in the corridors, girls shrieking with laughter as boys passed them, girls excitedly comparing notes on what they were going to wear on Christmas night. Why do they move, have to move in packs? Harry asked Ron as a dozen or so girls walked past them, snickering and staring at Harry. How are you supposed to get one on their own to ask them? <laughs> Lasso one? Ron suggested. Got any idea who you're going to try? I quoted Seinfeld. That's weird. <laughs> that almost never happens. This is the best we've come up with so far. 
He has a comedy routine in the old the old Seinfeld show. He has a comedy routine about why why men whistle, why they whistle and why they honk at women passing by because they don't know how else to engage with them. This is the best idea we've come up so far. <laughs> Harry didn't answer. He knew perfectly well whom he'd... Oh, uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Muscle through it. <laughs> he knew perfectly well whom he'd like to ask, but working up the nerve was something else. Cho was a year older than he was, which is why I found it extremely weird why Cho Chang was in Hogwarts. Um, uh, in Deathly Hallows, why she was at Hogwarts in the Room of Requirement. But then I realized that a bunch of people started coming in from outside Hogwarts, so she was probably just one of them. Like Jenny. Jenny wasn't originally. I sound like I'm rambling on. Okay, so in Deathly Hallows, part two in the movie, she's there in, she's there in the movie too, but I don't know if she appears until later. I know that she, when they're asking about the diadem, she's there. But at that point, anyway, um, when I first read that, and I... When I first read here that um, Cho was a year older than he was, I wrote the note, Deathly Hallows, right there. Because I was like, because when I made that note, I was like, then why is she in the room of requirement when Harry, Ron, and Hermione get there through Hogsmeade? Um, through uh, uh, Aberforth's bar, the tunnel. Because um, I was like, she shouldn't be at Hogwarts, she should have graduated. Um, but it's true in the movie as well, but in the book, they have, the word goes out that Harry is back and that we're going to start a battle now, even though that's not what Harry intended. And then people start coming back to Hogwarts, um, even previous students. And then we see Cho Chang. That's true in the movie too. In the movie, they have this brief shot of, I think it's Nigel, um, a character made up for the movie um, on the radio saying, lightning has struck, I repeat, lightning has struck, meaning Harry Potter is here. And so people hear that and they start coming to Hogwarts thinking that now is the final battle. Um, and so so arguably Cho Chang could have showed up because Ginny shows up and she wasn't at Hogwarts either. She left home for Easter break and never came back because they were afraid for her safety. Um, anyway, so I cleared that up for myself already. <laughs> She was very pretty. She was a very good Quidditch player, and she was also very popular. Ron seemed to know what was going on inside Harry's head. Listen, you're not going to have any trouble. You're a champion. You've just beaten a Hungarian horntail. I bet they'll be queuing up to go with you. I would be. Just saying. In tribute to their recently repaired friendship, Ron had kept the bitterness in his voice to a bare minimum. Moreover, to Harry's amazement, he turned out to be quite right. A curly-haired, third-year Hufflepuff girl to whom Harry had never spoken in his life asked him to go to the ball with her the very next day. Harry was so taken aback he said no before he'd even stopped to consider the matter. The girl walked off. <laughs> My friends used to like to joke in high school that that girl is me, that that's me in the story. <laughs> there I am! Uh, the girl walked off looking rather hurt, and Harry had to endure Dean's shameses and Ron's taunts about her all through History of Magic. The following day, two more girls asked him, a second year, and to his horror, a fifth year, who looked as though she might knock him out if he refused. <laughs> Isn't that nice? There's always kind of... That sounds bad. I was about to say, this part always makes me bitter. Not bitter. A little sus. Um, uh, when Harry says, why do, you have, why do they have to move in packs? The thing is, I never did in school. I still don't. Like, I have friends, but I'm very much alone most of the time. Men don't have an excuse not to ask me out. That's what I'm trying to say. Men can't make that excuse with me. I don't get asked out, like, ever. And I'm not in a group. I'm usually alone and very approachable. I don't know why it doesn't happen. That's what it makes me think of. Anyway, I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter at all. <laughs> uh, 
She was quite good looking, said Ron fairly, after he had stopped laughing. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> oh, Ron. <laughs> oh, wait, he was probably talking about the fifth year, not me. Dang it. I know they weren't talking about me because of the next sentence. She was a foot taller than me. <laughs> That's not true. I'm barely five feet. Still un unnerved. Imagine what I'd look like trying to dance with her. Hermione's words about Crumb kept coming back to him. They only like him because he's famous. Harry doubted very much if any of the girls who had asked to be his partner so far would have wanted to go to the ball with him if he hadn't been a school champion. I would. I would, Harry. Then he wondered if this would bother that. Then he wondered if this would bother him if Cho asked him. On the whole, Harry had to admit that even with the embarrassing prospect of opening the ball before him, life had definitely improved since he had got through the first task. He wasn't attracting nearly as much unpleasantness in the corridors anymore, which he suspected had a lot to do with Cedric. He had an idea Cedric might have told the Hufflepuffs to leave Harry alone, in gratitude for Harry's tip-off about the dragons. There seemed to be fewer support Cedric Diggory badges around, too. Draco Malfoy, of course, was still quoting Rita Skeeter's article to him at every possible opportunity, but he was getting fewer and fewer laughs out of it. And just to heighten Harry's feeling of well-being, no story about Hagrid had appeared in the Daily Prophet. No, you'll hear about that, though. She didn't seem very interested in magical creatures, to tell you the truth. Hagrid said when Harry, Ron, and Hermione asked him how his interview with Rita Skeeter had gone during the last Care of Magical Creatures lesson of the term. To their very great re well, I thought Hagrid was talking. To their very great relief, Hagrid had given up on direct contact with the Scroots now, and they were merely sheltering behind his cabin today, sitting at a trestle table and preparing a fresh selection of food with which to tempt the Scroots. She just wanted me to talk about you, Harry. Hagrid continued in a low voice. Well. I told her we'd been friends since I went to fetch you from the Dursleys. Never had to tell him off in forty. Never had to tell him off in four years. She said, "Never played you up in lessons, has he?" I told her no, and she didn't seem happy at all. You think she wanted me to say you were horrible, Harry? Of course she did," said Harry, throwing lumps of dragon liver into a large metal bowl and picking up his knife to cut some more. She can't keep writing about what a tragic little hero I am. It'll get boring. She wants a new angle, Hagrid, said Ron wisely as he shelled salamander eggs. You were supposed to say Harry's a mad delinquent. But he's not, said Hagrid, looking genuinely shocked. She should have interviewed Snape, said Harry grimly. He'd give her the goods on me any day. Potter has been crossing lines ever since he first arrived at this school. Said that, did he? said Hagrid, while Ron and Hermione laughed. Well, you might have been a few rules, Harry, but you all right, really, aren't you? Cheers, Hagrid, said Harry, grinning. You coming to this bowl thing on Christmas Day, Hagrid? said Ron. Thought I might look on it. Look, bleh. Thought I might look in on it, yeah? said Hagrid gruffly. Should be a good do, I reckon. You'll be opening the dancing, won't you, Harry? Who you taking? No one yet, said Harry, feeling himself going red again. Hagrid didn't pursue the subject. The last week of term became increasingly boisterous as it progressed. Rumors about the Yule Ball were flying everywhere, though Harry didn't believe half of them. For instance, that Dumbledore had bought 800 barrels of mulled mead from Madame Rose Murda. It seemed to be fact, however, that he had booked the Weird Sisters. Exactly who or what the Weird Sisters were, Harry didn't know, never having had access to a wizard's wireless, but he deduced from the wild excitement of those who had grown up listening to the WWN, Wizarding Wireless Network, that they were a very famous musical group. They're named after the Greek mythology Weird Sisters, the three sisters that supposedly um, decide the fate of all mortals. Some of the teachers, like little Professor Flitwick, gave up trying to teach them much when their minds were so clearly elsewhere. He allowed them to play games in his lesson on Wednesday and spent most of it talking to Harry about the perfect summoning charm Harry had used during the first task of the Triwizard Tournament. Oh, that's nice. Other teachers were not so generous. Nothing would ever deflect Professor Binns, for example, from plowing on through his notes on Goblin Rebellions. As Binns hadn't let his own death stand in the way of continuing to teach, they supposed a small thing like Christmas wasn't going to put him off. 
It was amazing how he could make even bloody and vicious goblin riots sound as boring as Percy's Cauldron Bottom report. Professors McGonagall and Moody kept them working until the very last second of their classes, too. And Snape, of course, would no sooner let them play games in class than adopt Harry. Stir Staring nastily around them all, he informed them that he would be testing them on poison antidotes during the last lesson of the term. Evil he is, Ron said bitterly that night in the Gryffindor common room, springing a test on us on the last day, ruining the last bit of term with a whole load of studying. Hmm. You're not exactly straining yourselves, though, are you? said Hermione, looking at him over the top of her potions notes. Ron was busy building a card castle out of his exploding snap pack, a much more interesting pastime than the muggle cards because of the chance that the whole thing would blow up at any second. It's Christmas, Hermione, said Harry lazily. He was rereading Flying with the Cannons for the tenth time in an armchair near the fire. Hermione looked severely over at him, too. I'd have thought you'd be doing something constructive, Harry, even if you don't want to learn your antidotes. Like what? Harry said as he watched Joey Jenkins of the cannons belt a bludger toward a bally castle bats chaser. That egg? Hermione hissed. Come on, Hermione, I've got till February the 24th, Harry said. He had put the golden egg upstairs in his trunk and hadn't opened it since the celebration party after the first task. There were still two and a half months to go until he needed to know what all the screechy wailing meant after all. But it might take weeks to work it out, said Hermione. You're going to look like a real idiot if everyone else knows what the next task is, and you don't. Leave him alone, Hermione. He's had a bit of a break, said Ron, and he placed the last two cards on top of the castle, and the whole lot blew up, singeing his eyebrows. Nice look, Ron. Go well with your dress robes, that will. It was Fred and George. They sat down at the table with Harry and Ron and Hermione as Ron felt how much damage he had been done. Ron, can we borrow Pigwigeon? George asked. No, he's off delivering a letter, said Ron. Why? Because George wants to invite him to the ball, said Fred sarcastically. Because we want to send a letter, you stupid great prat, said George. Who do you, who do you two keep writing to, eh? said Ron. Nose out, Ron, or I'll burn that for you too, said Fred, waving his wand threateningly. So, you lock out dates for the ball yet? Nope, said Ron. Well, you'd better hurry up, mate, or all the good ones will be gone, said Ron. Said Fred. I'm excited. Who are you going with then? Said Ron. Angelina, said Fred promptly, without a trace of embarrassment. What? Said Ron, taking it back. You've already asked her? Good point, said Fred. He turned his head and called across the common room. Oi! Angelina! Angelina, who had been chatting with Alicia Spinnet, turned the f uh, near the fire, looked over at him. What? She called back. Want to, go, want, to, want to come to the bowl with me? Angelina gave Fred an appraising sort of look. All right, then, she said, and she turned back to Alicia and carried on chatting with a bit of a grin on her face. There you go, said Fred to Harry and Ron. Piece of cake. Easy. <laughs> he got to his feet yawning and said, We'd better use a school owl then, George. Come on. They left. Ron stopped feeling his eyebrows and looked across the smoldering wreck of his card castle at Harry. We should get a move on, you know. Ask someone. He's right. We don't want to end up with a pair of trolls. Hermione let out a sputter of indignation. A pair of... What? Excuse me? Well, you know, said Ron shrugging. I'd rather go alone than with... With Eloise Midgen, say. Eh? That's terrible. Her acne's loads better lately, and she's really nice. Her nose is off center, said Ron. Oh, I see, Hermione said, bristling. So basically, you're going to take the best looking girl who'll have you, even if she's completely horrible. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right, said Ron. I'm going to bed, Hermione snapped, and she swept off toward the girl's staircase without another word. Something's going on there. Something's going on there. 
Hogwarts staff demonstrating a continued desire to impress the visitors from Bo Battens, and Durmstrang seemed determined to show the castle at its best this Christmas. When the decorations went up, Harry noticed that they were the most stunning he had yet seen inside the school. Everlasting icicles had been attached to the banisters of the marble staircase. The usual twelve Christmas trees in the Great Hall were bedecked with everything from luminous holly berries to real hooting golden owls, and the suits of armor had all been bewitched to sing carols whenever anyone passed them. It was quite something to hear O Come All Ye Faithful, sung by an empty helmet that only knew half the words. Several times Filch the caretaker had to extract Peeves from inside the armor, where he had taken to hiding, filling in the gaps in the songs with lyrics of his own invention, all of which were very rude. And still Harry hadn't asked Joe to the ball. He and Ron were getting very nervous now. Though as Harry pointed out, Ron would look much less stupid than he would without a partner. Harry was supposed to be starting the dancing with the other champions. I suppose there's always moaning Myrtle, he said gloomily, referring to the ghost who haunted the girls' toilets on the second floor. Harry, we've just got to grit our teeth and do it, said Ron on Friday morning in a tone that suggested they were planning the storming of an impregnable fortress. Well, <laughs> there's a joke there. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but there's a joke there. <laughs> when we get back to the common room tonight, we'll both have partners. Agreed? Uh, okay, said Harry. But every time he glimpsed Cho that day, during break and then lunchtime and once on the way to History of Magic, she was surrounded by friends. Didn't she ever go anywhere alone? Could he perhaps ambush her as she was going into a bathroom? God, Harry, no! Don't be a creep! <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wrote that on the side. I was like, um, creepy? Ew, don't do that! But no, she even seemed to go there with an escort of four or five girls. Yeah, girls do that. Yet if he didn't do it soon, she was bound to have been asked by somebody else. I remember... In the movie, when Harry, like, it's the part where Harry and Ron are walking through the the entrance courtyard, and he says, why do they have to travel in packs? And, like, they come up to uh, Cho Chang and her friends, a group of Ravenclaw girls, and how they look at Harry and Ron, and they look at them disgusted. And I'm just, like, heartbroken. I'm absolutely heartbroken by that. I would never treat a guy like that. I would never... Okay, I not not to say that I haven't before, um, but now in a more more mature state, I could never do that because I know that it takes a lot of courage for guys to ask girls. In fact, reading this book, it like opened my eyes to the way guys see things, especially in the dating aspect, at least a little bit, um, and how scary it is for them to approach girls and ask them and. I might not always, that doesn't guarantee that I'll say yes, but I will always treat them with respect, you know. I will never treat them as like they're disgusting and I want nothing to do with them. Nothing like that. I'm not, I want to make it as easy, I want to make it as pleasant as possible for them to talk to me and to ask me out. That's, that's, the, that's my heart. My heart is that I want them to feel comfortable approaching me, um, making them feel like they don't have to be afraid. You know, oh man, I wish I could. I wish I had the opportunity. Uh, he found it hard to concentrate on Snape's potions test and consequently forgot to add the key ingredient, a bazaar, meaning that he received bottom marks. He didn't care, though. He was too busy screwing up his courage for what he was about to do. When the bell rang, he grabbed his bag and hurried to the dungeon door. We all know what a bazaar does, right? It will cure most poisons. I'll meet you at dinner, he said to Ron and Hermione, and he dashed off upstairs. He just have to ask Joe for a private word, that was all. He hurried off through the packed corridors looking for her, and rather sooner than he'd expected, he found her, emerging from a defense against the dark arts lesson. Uh, Cho, could I have a word with you? 
Oh, I can feel it in my soul. I can feel his nerves. And also how exciting that would be if Harry said that to me. <laughs> Giggling should be made illegal, Harry thought fiercely as all the girls around Cho started doing it. She didn't, though. No, no. We're going to be nice. Be nice. Please be nice to him. Please be nice to him. She said, okay, and followed him out of earshot of her classmates. I don't know if I could pull off. Do you think I could pull off the Scottish accent? Probably not well. She, there's nothing in the book that says she's Scottish, but the actress who plays her is Scottish, so she's Scottish in the movie. <laughs> I don't know if I could pull it off. I'm not great with accents. I'm decent, but I'm not great. Um, Harry turned to look at her, and his stomach gave a weird lurch as though he had missed a step going downstairs. Uh, he said. He couldn't ask her. He couldn't, but he had to. Cho stood there, looking puzzled, watching him. That's literally what it says. I love J.K. Rowling. I love the way she writes this. She writes this the way he's thinking it, the way he's feeling it. Her sentences are shorter and more rambly um, because... Hello. <laughs> because um, because that's how he feels inside. And so uh, she conveys it really well. I'll read that again. He couldn't ask her. He couldn't, but he had to. Cho stood there, looking puzzled, watching him. The words came out before Harry had quite got his tongue around them. Want to go with a bubble <laughs> That's literally like how it's spelled. It's literally just like one word. <laughs> he says it so fast that she can't even comprehend it. Sorry, said Cho. Do you, do you want to go to the ball with me, said Harry. Why did he have to go red now? Why? <laughs> oh, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, said Cho, and she went red too. Oh, Harry, I'm really sorry. She true, and she truly looked it. I already said I'll go with someone else. Oh, said Harry. It was odd. A moment before his insides had been writhing like snakes, but suddenly he didn't seem to have any insides at all. Oh, okay, he said. No problem. I'm really sorry, she said again. That's okay, said Harry. They stood there looking at each other, and then Cho said, Well, yeah, said Harry. Well, bye, said Cho, still very red. She walked away. Harry called after her before he could stop himself. Harry, don't do this, you fool. Who are you going with? Oh, Cedric, she said. Cedric Diggory? Oh, right, said Harry. His insides had come back again. It felt as though they had been filled with lead in their absence. Completely forgetting about dinner, he walked slowly back up to Gryffindor Tower, Cho's voice echoing in his ears with every step he took. Cedric. Cedric Diggory. Hate that guy. <laughs> Um, he had been starting to quite like Cedric, prepared to overlook the fact that he had once beaten him at Quidditch, and was handsome and popular and nearly everyone's favorite champion. Now he suddenly realized that Cedric was in fact a useless pretty boy who didn't have enough brains to fill an egg cup. <laughs> oh, you're reading Goblet of Fire too? Yay! Is it your first time? Because this is my... Eighth time reading this one. Uh. Fairy lights, he said dully to the fat lady. The password had been changed the previous day. Yes, indeed, dear, she tr trilled, straightening her new tinsel hair band as she swung forward to admit him. Entering the common room, Harry looked around, and to his surprise, he saw Ron sitting, ashen-faced, in a distant corner. Jenny was sitting with him, talking to him in what seemed to be a low, soothing voice. "'What's up, Ron?' said Harry, joining them. Ron looked up at Harry, a sort of blind horror in his face. "'Why did I do it?' he said wildly. "'I don't know what made me do it.' "'What?' said Harry. "'He, uh, just asked Flor Delacour to go to the ball with him,' said Jenny.' 
She looked as though she was fighting back a smile, but she kept patting Ron's arm sympathetically. You what? said Harry. I don't know what made me do it, Ron gasped again. What was I playing at? There were people all around. I've gone mad. Everyone watching. I was just walking past her in the entrance hall. She was standing there talking to Diggory, and it sort of came over me. And I asked her. Ron moaned and put his face in his hands. He kept talking, though the words were barely distinguishable. She looked at me like I was a sea slug or something. Didn't even answer. And then, I don't know, I just sort of came to my senses and ran for it. She's Pop Vila, said Harry. You were right. Her grandmother was one. It wasn't your fault. I bet you just walked past when she was turning on the old charm for Diggory and got a blast of it. But she was wasting your time. He's going with Cho Chang. Ron looked up. I asked her to go with me just now, Harry said dully, and she told me. Ginny had suddenly stopped smiling. Exactly. <laughs> me too, Ginny. <laughs> this is mad, said Ron. We're the only ones left who haven't called anyone. Well, except Neville. Hey, guess who he asked? Hermione. What? said Ron. Comp not Ron. Said Harry, completely distracted by the startling news. Yeah, I know, said Ron, some of the color coming back into his face as he started to laugh. He told me after potions. Said she'd always been really nice, helping him out with work and stuff. But she told him she was already going with someone. Ha! <laughs> as if. She just didn't want to go with Neville. I mean, who would? That's so mean. I would totally go with Neville. It's so mean. And of course, Hermione is actually going with somebody. Don't, said Jenny, annoyed. Don't laugh. And she's annoyed because she's going with Neville. We'll figure that out soon. Just then, Hermione climbed in through the portrait hole. Why weren't you two at dinner? She said, coming over to join them. Because, oh, shut up laughing, you two. Because they've both just been turned down by girls they asked to the ball, said Jenny. That shut Harry and Ron up. <laughs> no, definitely not first time. I've read all the books lots of times before, too. Hey, Ron, don't disrespect Neville like that. He's the best. He is great. <laughs> Good. Lots of times. Yep. Um, there was a time when I read them every year, but I've expanded. Um, I'm reading other books now. <laughs> um, I used to read them every year during the summer, but then I started um, picking a different book series to read every summer. Usually it's a book series I've read before. This summer, actually, not this summer, Summer of last year, um, I read for the first time the Lord of the Rings series. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I've read these books many, many times. And I like to keep track, as, you, as, I, as I'm sure you figured out. I have tally marks at the beginning. Thanks a bunch, Jenny, said Ron sourly. All the good-looking ones taken, Ron, said Hermione loftily. Oh, he's smidgen's starting to look quite pretty now, is she? Well, I'm sure you'll find someone somewhere who'll have you. <laughs> but Ron was staring at Hermione as though suddenly seeing her in a whole new light. <laughs> Hermione, Neville's right. You are a girl. Oh, well spotted, she said acidly. Well, you can come with one of us. No, I can't snapped Hermione. Oh, come on, he said impatiently. We need partners. We're going to look really stupid if we haven't got any. Everyone else has. I can't come with you, said Hermione, now blushing, because I'm already going with someone. No, you're not, said Ron. You just said that to get rid of Neville. Oh, did I? said Hermione, and her eyes flashed dangerously. Just because it's taking you three years to notice, Ron, doesn't mean no one else has spotted. I'm a girl. Ron stared at her, then he grinned again. Okay, okay, we know you're a girl, he said. That do? Will you come now? I've already told you, Hermione said very angrily. I'm going with someone else. And she stormed off toward the girls' dormitories again. She's lying, said Ron flatly, watching her go. She's not, said Jenny quietly. Who is it then, said Ron sharply. I'm not telling you, it's her business, said Jenny. Right, said Ron, who looked extremely put out. This is getting stupid. Jenny, you can go with Harry, and I'll just... 
awe to think it was this close. This close it would have been Harry and Ginny and then Hermione and Ron. So close! But didn't quite pan out. I can't, said Ginny, and she went scarlet too. I'm going with... with Neville. He asked me when Hermione said no, and I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to go otherwise. I'm not in fourth year. She looked extremely miserable. I think I'll go and have dinner, she said, and she got up and walked off to the portrait hole. Her head bowed. Ron goggled at Harry. What's got into them? he demanded. But Harry had just seen Par Parvati and Lavender come in through the portrait hole. The time had come for drastic action. Wait here, he said to Ron, and he stood up, walked straight up to Parvati, and said, Pa- I can't- I feel like I keep pronouncing her name differently every time I say it. Poverty, we go to the ball with me. Poverty went into a fit of giggles. Harry waited for them to subside, his fingers crossed in the pocket of his robes. See, in the movie, her mo her, her name is said one time. I don't even think it's said in Goblet of Fire in the movie. No, her name, like, McGonagall calls her Miss Patil. Ron, not Ron, Harry never says her name. So I'm thinking, it's, her name is said once, though. It's said in the Prisoner of Azkaban movie. Professor Lupin says it, but he says Parvati. I don't know which part to emphasize. I've heard Parvati, I've heard Parvati, Parvati. I don't know how to pronounce her name. He says it when they're doing the uh, the Boggart, Boggart? Boggart scene, yeah. Um, he calls her up, and she's the one who turns the cobra into the creepy-ass jack-in-the-box. <laughs> uh. Yes, yeah, all right then, she said finally, blushing furiously. Oh, that's probably why J.K. Rowling pointed her out earlier, because Harry's going to ask her later. Um. Thanks, said Harry in relief. Lavender, will you go with Ron? She's going with Seamus, said Parvati, and the pair of them giggled harder than ever. Harry sighed. Can't you think of anyone who'd go with Ron? He said, lowering his voice so that Ron wouldn't hear. What about Hermione Granger, said Parvati. She's going with someone else. Parvati looked astonished. Ooh, who? She said keenly. Harry shrugged. No idea, he said. So what about Ron? Well, said Parvati slowly, I suppose my sister might. Padma, you know, and Ravenclaw. I'll ask her if you like. Yeah, that would be great, said Harry. Let me know, will you? And he went back over to Ron, feeling that this ball was a lot more trouble than it was worth, and hoping very much that Padma Patil's nose was dead center. <laughs> All right, and that's the end of chapter 22. Um, yeah, great, so good. And then, not next week, because next week is my birthday stream, and I'm not going to be reading. I am going to be streaming next Saturday, but it's my birthday stream, so I won't be reading. But I will be reading the next week, hopefully. And the chapters we'll be reading for that week are chapter 23, The Yule Ball, which is also one of my favorite chapters, top three for sure. Um, and then the one after that... Is my is it my favorite chapter? Is my favorite chapter the one after that? Oh, it isn't. Ah, oh, I thought we were gonna have a two for anyway. That's okay. Um, and then the chapter after that will be chapter twenty four, Rita Skeeter's scoop. And those are the chapters we'll be reading next time. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the stream. I very much did. Um, please. Uh, feel free to leave a like on the stream or on the video if you're watching this and it's no longer live. Feel free to chat in the comments. I respond to comments. Um, and if you have uh, not subscribed already, click subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you can be notified the next time I upload and the next time I go live. Um, if you want to know when I'll be live streaming, you can follow me on Twitter. Link in the description. I give my schedule there and what I'm going to be streaming. Um, I also have a Patreon if you'd like to support 
um, me as a content creator. Um, I also am a writer, and I have writing on there as well. If you can't afford to be a Patreon, no, if you can't afford to be a patron, is what they call it, um, there's free stuff on there as well. Um, and uh, what is free on there right now is my fan fiction. I have Harry Potter fan fiction that I'm currently working on. I have the prologue, chapters one and chapter two on there if you'd like to read them. Um, and uh, I also have a TikTok and an Instagram. Both are linked in the description. Uh, Dean and Seamus should have gone together, though. To be honest, but he went with Lavender for some reason. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Interesting idea. But anyway, yes, uh, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a magical evening. Bye-bye.